Okay, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back to the museum. So, uh, in any case, welcome back to another Launchpad lecture. Uh, this month, uh, I am obviously getting the lecture again. I am Chris Orwell, director of the museum. I'll give a little bit more background. We're going to have a little bit of fun with some of the background stuff today in honor of Mother's Day, which is coming up. If you didn't remember that, so remember now. Today's topic, we choose to go to the moon, JFK speeches and the space race. A little bit less maybe of what you may be thinking of the space race and a lot more about JFK's speeches. Because there's two significant ones that we're going to be talking about today. Um, even though he gave, you know, obviously tons of speeches uh, during his term. There's two that we're going to concentrate on today. And we're going to concentrate more on the political context around those speeches and some of the historical context. Because mostly when you look, when we look back at the Apollo program, we tend to look at it through that technological and that hero, that hero standpoint. We talk about the astronauts. We talk about mission control. We talk about the engineers. We don't necessarily always talk about the politics of the day and the fact that that program really at times was on very tenuous footing as to whether or not it was going to happen, going to continue, going to get funded, et cetera, et cetera. So that's really what we're going to be going over today. So welcome in any, please work. Technology. <laughs> I just tested it. <laughs> You've got to be kidding. So. FCE to AUX. Yeah, I know. It's changing. Reboot the presentation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, as always, I start off with a quote. In this situation, this project originally announced by President Kennedy on May 25th, 1961, looms really large in the history of not just the nation, but of the world for the 20th century. One of the historians from Harvard University. So, once again, I always give my background. Usually I show a couple other pictures, you know. So this time, yes, I grew up in Downey, California, where the Apollo Command Module was built. So I was around the Apollo program. Growing up, also the space shuttle was built there. Um, what you're seeing there is the uh, uh, the demonstration room that they had. So, and the shuttle that was built in there. This Downey was also the home to Taco Bell. Taco Bell started there. The oldest McDonald's in the United States is also in Downey, California. In case you didn't know that. So, once again, being involved, Mother's Day. Okay, so they, my mom. Whoops, excuse me. Used to take me. That's me. That's my mom right there to all the, the times when the astronauts would come back from their missions. Part of this was part of the politics of the day. And it was NASA's effort to influence the politics by influencing the people. You come back, you have these big grand celebrations, you honor the folks who work on the program, you get the community involved, the community tells their congressmen and their senators and the president, keep funding the program. It's all part of it. So, also growing up, I'm going to talk about my wife, who's mother to my nine children. That's our first date. Nine. Prom. Nine. So, so in, any, in any case, though, so this is me throwing her into the fountain after we graduated. I was talking about the fact that I graduated from the Naval Academy. There we are, last week, graduation week at the, at the Naval Academy. So, and I have three graduates this weekend, two NMSU and one high school graduate this weekend. Yay! So, in any case, though, after the color parade, throwing her in the fountain, there we are, mom, wife, mother of my children. So in any case, at graduation, celebrate graduations this week. Anybody else that got out there gotten graduates by chance? Yay, so in any case. Um, uh, then I joined the Navy, drove submarines around, or joined the Navy. I was in the Navy, I graduated, I joined the active duty Navy doing real work, not just studying. So ballistic missile submarines, uh, attack submarines, um, diesel submarines. And actually the chance to launch two of these things. So I have actually launched two missiles during my lifetime as well. So in any case, then uh, after the Navy went on, uh, headed up the Kansas Cosmosphere and Space Center, now just the Cosmosphere. And there is wife and nine children a number of years ago. So in any case, yeah. These younger, this one right here is the one who's graduated college right now. Wow. That's scary. <laughs> <laughs> so in any case, and I sent him to space. <laughs> so in any case, is there any other space program which promises dramatic results in which we could win? Memo from President Kennedy to Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson, who was heading up his National Space Council. This was back in April 20th, 1961. We're going to talk about that memo here in a little bit. So, but before we can get to this day, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong walking on the surface of the moon, we have to go back a little bit in time. 
And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to kind of give the historical context. And mostly here, the context that I'm going to give is really the space and a little bit of the pol political context, but a lot really about the space. So what, what had been going on? Well, 1957, if we go back to then, we have to go back, you know, rockets launching, a lot of it happening out here at White Sands Missile Range. A lot of the early days of our space program were all out here at White Sands Missile Range. But the firsts, when we look at a lot of the firsts that occurred, they weren't U.S. firsts. A lot of the big ones that got the political headlines were Russian firsts. So your first ICBM, essentially, the R-7, <coughs> here at far left, so Russian missile, 1957. 1957, October, Sputnik 1. We got one hanging up on the fifth floor at the museum. This really got Americans scared, very much so. And part of the reason for that is that mental... <coughs> excuse me, that thought process that we had traditionally had about military battles. How did you win military battles? And this goes back a long time. You had the high ground. Whoever controlled the high ground won the battle in all of recent history. If you controlled the air, high ground, you controlled the battlefield. If you controlled the hill, it could shoot down. You controlled, you know, the battlefield. Washington built Fort Necessity down in a valley. Dumb. Okay, so, you know, not exactly the smartest movie ever made. Um, but in any case, uh, that, so we were looking at this like, they're going to control the high ground. Does it really work that way in space? Not necessarily. <laughs> it's kind of a whole different thing. But in any case, that's the mental picture that Americans had who had just come out of World War II and, you know, 1957, Korea. So, satellite fired by Russia, circling U.S. 15 times a day. What's it doing up there? Besides that, what could they launch up there, put over the United States, and drop right down on us? Fear. Red menace. Sputnik. Beep, beep, beep. This is what's going through everybody's mind. 1957, now they do something even more. They launch Sputnik 2 with the dog in it. Laika, sadly, Laika doesn't live. So Laika was never going to come back. <laughs> But in any case, so Laika has launched up Living Creature in Space, another big first. 1959, excuse me, Luna 1, first object to actually escape Earth's gravity. And I heard gravity completely so, but in any case, though, so, and head out, you know, out of orbit from the US. So 1959, Luna 2. This one actually, now it's the first time that any sort of man made object gets to the moon and actually impacts the moon. So Luna 2, this is not real footage, very obviously. Computer recreation down here, but this is what the spacecraft looked like. Interestingly enough, in the spacecraft, they had one of these. It's not that big. Only about this big, with all these metal plates on it. CCCP, USSR, Soviet Union. The date on it. So, And then the idea is this thing hits the lunar surface, explodes out, and leaves pieces of USSR all over the moon. You know, kind of that we did this. Okay, once again now, I mean, we're, we're not getting too much into space right now in the U.S. satellites. We're just starting to really get into those programs of, uh, of orbital um, space flight. They're flying to the moon already. Not good for the American psyche. Whoops, sorry. 1959, Luna 3 actually flies around the moon, takes pictures of the far side of the moon, not the dark side of the moon. Okay, great song. Not a good scientific bit of information. So, far side of the moon. In any case, though, great pictures? No. But pictures of the far side of the moon, regardless. First time humans have ever seen the other side of our nearest neighbor. So, and don't use that term with your next door. So, in any case, um, in any case 1960, Sputnik 5, Belka and Strelka. First time that we launched a couple of big creatures like this and bring them back alive. And so, ah, uh, yay, we're doing it. And that, that, by the way, that is actually Belkin Strelka. They're stuffed in a museum. Oh, <laughs> so no. they're right, yeah, you can see right there. There's a guy taking a picture, you know, so. Yep, in any case, they did live their lives out, you know, so then after they died, they were stuffed. I mean, Ham lived a very long life, and he's buried out here. Yes? Did, did Russia, like, propaganda all of this? Oh, God, yes. Yes, oh, yes, like, yes, yes, that it was international news constantly. They were trumpeting everything that they did. Okay. Interestingly enough, and I, and I apologize, I'm going to be drinking coffee or, or tea here quite a bit, so just dry throat, allergies, etc. In any case, though, um, 
Interestingly enough, when the first launches were occurring, the Premier really wasn't thinking that this was that big of a deal. But after he saw the reaction of the first launches, then, then it became, oh yeah, <laughs> we're going to push this. Because everybody kind of became space mad, space crazy. We're going to have a new exhibit on that eventually up on the fifth floor. It's going to be all sorts of pop culture from the 50s and talks about all of this madness throughout the world about space and technology and everything. Atomic pop culture, if you really get down to it. Whoops, dang it. So, and then the big one, April 12th, 1961, Yuri Gagarin, first human in space. We were trying to get there, probably could have beaten them if we hadn't flown ham, if we'd flown Shepard instead of ham, whatever. In any case, though, the Russians got up. Re regardless of whether who would have been first, one of the key differences is that our first flight, 15 minutes, up and down, not orbital. Him? He was up there for, you know, over 100 minutes, you know, so a little bit longer. So, in any case, uh, Yuri Gagarin gets up in, in 1961, first man in space, big deal. Now, now they're really leading this Cold War space race that is developing. From Stettin to in the Baltic to Trieste and the Adriatic, an Iron Curtain has descended across the continent. That's where we, get, that's where we got the term, the Iron Curtain. So it came from Winston Churchill. He's dressed at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri. So politics of the day, um, once again, I'm giving the context into Kennedy's speech. So Kennedy gets elected in 1960. When is his inaugural address? January of that year. So January 1961 is his inaugural, yeah, inaugural address. Anybody know what this picture is from? Yeah. Cuba. Cuba, and what was... What was the, what do we call it? The Bay of Pigs invasion. So, Bay of Pigs invasion. So, did it go well? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, uh, it couldn't have, you know, and this is in April. Could not have gone worse um, for, uh, for the U.S. And this just follows on very shortly after Yuri Gagarin's flight. So, here's a brand new president who was elected, really, if you go back and, Take a look at the whys and wherefores, and, and that's, that's a whole semester in and of itself as to why Kennedy gets elected, you know, why any president gets elected. You could do a, do a semester on every single president in U.S. history and how they got elected. In any case, in Kennedy's situation, television really played a part for the first time ever. The vital, young, vibrant guy, president, future president, um, in these debates, you know, people who listened to the debates thought Nixon won, just on the issues and the discussion. People who watched the debate thought Kennedy won. Visuals matter now. Okay, so in any case, though, he gets elected. A lot of it, once again, because you got to take a look at that. You know, if you hear it and think one thing and you see it and think another, there's a visual aspect. He was a young guy, you know, so. In any case, though, so he was elected to try and revitalize the United States. Eisenhower had been aging, you know, during this time frame. It was a bit of a change because of that. And, and it was like, America's going to get revitalized. Well, here we are, just a few months into his presidency. We're way behind the Russians. We stink at that. We're Flopniks, whatever. So, and now we try Bay of Pigs invasion, a little secret invasion, and it just flops as well. Things are not going well for the Kennedy administration. Not going well at all. So, once again, just a little, now, now I'm going to take a look at the U.S. side, because I'm kind of giving you now what was going on space-wise and a little bit of the now political situation going on in the U.S. So, let me just go back timeline here, so of some of how we get to where NASA is at this point in time and the United States. So, Eisenhower uh, makes, the, uh, makes the announcements during the, uh, uh, the Oh, shoot me. International, International Geophysical, Geophysical Year. Year. Yep, sorry. Mm -hmm. My brain went for a second. So, in any case, though, um, uh, yeah, in fact, it's right here. I should have just read it, you know, so sorry. So, um, uh, Sputnik gets launched in November. We eventually, in December, get up um, a, a Vanguard satellite as well. Um, or the Vanguard TV-3 is attempted to be launched. It explodes on the pad. Total disaster. Eventually, we get Explorer 1 up in 1958. There's a special committee in 1958 um, on space and aeronautics. House, same thing. The Space <coughs> Act is created, which creates the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, in 1958. Prior to Kennedy, 
coming on board. So NASA exists before Kennedy comes on board. Guess what? The Mercury program exists before Kennedy comes on board. Um, we're already heading towards human spaceflight. And obviously, when Kennedy gets in, we have our first manned spaceflight after Yuri Gagarin. But everything had been moving up towards that point. But it was just moving up towards manned spaceflight, not with any very specific long-term goal. That's a little bit problematic. Uh, just a shot of uh, Eisenhower once again looking uh, and talking to, uh, to NASA about what's going on. Yeah, we had our, uh, our issue with Vanguard where it explodes on the pad. So the view of the U.S. space program is not super positive at this point, even though we're having successes. So the Congress hereby declares, oh, this is, by the way, the National Space um, uh, Aeronautics Space Act, that it is the policy of the United States that activities in space should be devoted to peaceful purposes for the benefit of all mankind. Yes. But then again, we do also use space and rockets for military purposes. And oh, by the way, all of our original manned, excuse me, crewed, it's, it, it's always going to be difficult for me to get out of that. So, but, but saying crewed spacecraft, because it does sound like it's a nasty spacecraft as opposed mm -hmm. to one that has humans in it, in any case. So spacecraft with the humans that were flying were on military rockets. Yeah, NASA's really got to come up with something different than crewed. <laughs> so in any case, we have these seven intrepid individuals. So the original Mercury 7 astronauts, heroes all, shall we say. You know, there's a little right stuff quote for you. So um, uh, uh, that are getting ready to fly um, as Kennedy takes, uh, takes over the reins of the country. And on May 5th, so remember, Yuri flies on April 12th, May 5th, less than a month later, of 1961, Alan Shepard, Alan B. Shepard, excuse me, flies on his 15 minute, 28 second ballistic shot on a Mercury Redstone rocket. Uh, it is watched by Kennedy. There's Johnson here as well. They're watching, I love that TV <laughs> that they're watching it on. So this is in the secretary's office. I love that. <laughs> so, and they're just standing there watching it, you know. So in any case though, he was interested in the space program. Not devoted to it in any way, shape or form yet really, but he was interested in it. He was interested in the astronauts, etc. Whoops. There we go again. So, so after you know, and I love here he's pointing at uh, at the uh, at, at the submissions getting ready to go, and had the astronauts there afterwards. Big ceremony celebrating the first American in space uh, with the with the medal that he presents. To Alan Shepard drops it on the ground. Very funny sequence, you know. I give you this medal that came from the ground up, etc. So, pins it on him. Everybody gets a good laugh out of it. He was very good. He was an excellent extemporaneous speaker and very humorous. When you look at his speeches, similar to Reagan, he and Reagan had a lot of similarities in the way that they could deliver speeches, just talk to people. Um, and if you look at the, the, the margins of their notes and in the speeches, there's always changes. They worked with their speechwriters very carefully, and even up to the very end were making changes. Lincoln did the same thing. Um, uh, in any case, though, um, uh, so, but like I said, very good extemporaneous speaker. So. This, um, the, uh, uh, excuse me, when Yuri Gagarin uh, has his flight right after it and before Shepard flies, Kennedy sends a memo, memo to the Vice President, once again, who is in charge of the National Space Council. So, in accordance with our conversation, I would like for you as Chairman of the Space Council, because you probably, you might be able to read this, you might not, those in the back, so, um, uh, to be in charge of making an overall survey of where we stand in space. Do, one, do we have a chance of beating the Soviets by putting a laboratory in space, or by a trip around the moon, or by a rocket to land on the moon, or by a rocket to go to the moon and back with a man? Is there any other space program which promises dramatic results in which we could win? How much additional would it cost? Three, are we working 24 hours a day on existing programs? If not, why not? If not, will you make recommendations to me as to how we can get work speeded up? For in building large boosters, should we put an emphasis on nuclear, chemical, or liquid fuel, or a combination of these three? Five, are we making maximum effort? Are we achieving necessary results? And then I've asked a number of uh, um, uh, folks to, to cooperate with you. And I would appreciate a report on this at the earliest possible moment. So, Linda B. Johnson, who's the Vice President, head of the uh, Space Council, gets together a number of folks. I mean, you're talking about people from industry, uh, head of NBC, people from NASA, military, 
et cetera, et cetera, all, you know, he gets them together and they try to figure out answers to these questions. So on the 28th of April, and these are, this is the actual response memo um, going back, and it's a little bit longer as you can see here, you know, so I am not going to read the, uh, um, the entire thing. So, but in it, um, you know, once again, when you go back to the questions, do we have a chance of beating Soviets by putting a laboratory in space? No, you know, I mean, they're, they're emphatic about that. So how much additional would it cost? I mean, when they start to talk about the costs, you're getting into the 20 to 40 billion dollar range. Nowadays, we sit there and go, 20 billion? Yeah, <laughs> not a big deal. Anybody know what the budget was in 1961? Billion? Yeah. Oh, no, 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 much more than that, but 94.4 billion. Or actually, excuse me, 94.7 billion. Sorry, off by 0.3 billion. In any case, though, just a small change. Um, 94.7 billion. They're talking about a program of 20 to 40 billion dollars. Hmm. Calculate that out to modern numbers. I have to actually get this to, to take a look at it. So, because the bu the budget these days is 4.2 trillion. <laughs> we spend a hell of a lot more than that. When you look at the actual expenditures for this year, it, it's not 4.2 trillion. A lot more than that. So, but in any case, though, the budget is 4.2 trillion. So that would be them recommending a program that would be 982 billion to 1.9 trillion dollars. Now, that's not in one year. That's spread out over a period of time. They were talking about the 1967 time frame of being able to get a man on the moon, possibly, as one of the the recommendations in all of this. So, um, let me get down to. Just the fun stuff. Uh, we, are we making maximum effort? Are we achieving necessary results? Answer number five. We are neither making maximum effort <laughs> nor achieving results necessary if this country is to reach a position of leadership. So as you can imagine, the memo coming back was not very positive about how we stand in that competition with the Soviets. Because once again, at this point in time, are we in a hot conflict with the, with the Soviet Union and the Russians? No. We are into that Cold War. Basically, we are competing in all sorts of different areas. We're competing on territory. In other words, who can control what countries around the world? Who can be the overseer, shall we say, or the supporter for those nations? The Iron Curtain, they've taken over a number of countries. Um, so we have conflicts that are going on around the world that are hot, but it's not the US and the Soviets directly fighting. We have technological battles. Who's better? Who can produce more agriculture? Who can produce more scientifically? Who can get more spacecraft up into space? All those things are where we're competing. And in this arena, <gasps> it ain't happening. Why does it matter here? Because this is getting international coverage interest. It's getting American interest, et cetera, et cetera. So politically, it's a big deal. April 29th, day after, Werner von Braun sends to the Vice President of the United States, although he'd been part of the group talking with the National Space Council, he sends a long memo answering the same questions in more detail. Um, the, uh, the, once again, same basic information, very, very negative. So summing up, I should like to say that in the space race we are competing with a determined opponent whose peacetime economy is on a wartime footing. Cold War. Most of our procedures are designed for orderly peacetime conditions. I do not believe that we can win this race unless we take at least some measures which thus far have been considered acceptable only in times of national emergency. So you can see what the recommendations are heading towards. They're heading towards a huge recommendation of a program on the scale of the Manhattan Project, on the scale of the Panama Canal being built, you know, things like that. So in any case, that's what's being recommended as the only way that we can catch up and or beat the, the, the Soviet Union. So, um, May 4th, uh, this is from Overton Brooks from Louisiana, who was a Democrat, who was the chair of the House Committee on Science and Astronautics. It is my belief, and I think on this point, that I can speak for our committee that the United States must do whatever is necessary to gain unequivocal leadership in space exploration. So you're starting to see everything align towards something coming out of this politically, for certain. Quote from John Kennedy, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. 
That was said during his speech to the Joint Session of Congress on May 25th, 1961. So just a month after all of this memo stuff really started, he makes this proclamation. Very bold. Incredibly bold proclamation at that point in time. So a lot of people, when they think of Kennedy's moon speech, they think of a different one. They think of the one at Rice University. So which is the more eloquent speech? And we'll talk about that during this thing. But the one that started us on the path was this one on May 25th in front of the joint session. Here he is. He spoke for 46 minutes. He did not talk for 46 minutes about space. He <sighs> talked about a lot of things. This was not a, you know, when you think of the, those, those eloquent speeches that motivate everybody and inspire everybody, this wasn't the inspirational speech. This was filled with program after program, you know, so of, of what America should be doing based on what he was thinking. But part of it, a part of the speech, dealt with space. And it was very, very, very important because it started the U.S. on probably one of the biggest programs going at that point in time. Whoops, did it again. Here he is, just wanted to, <coughs> nice color picture, kind of backed out. And then here he is speaking. So at this point, I'm going to have this up right, for just a moment. This is the, his actual speech notes, you know, for the section on space. And you can see it's page 64 up here. So... In any case, though, but you'll see cross-outs, underlines, stuff in the, you know, sec in the sec side sections, etc. Okay, so, whoops, let me just leave it right there, because I'm actually going to, as long as everything works fine, take you. Oh, that was me. It is the most important decision that we make as a nation. But uh, all of you have lived uh, through the last four years and have seen the significance of space and the adventures in space. And no one can predict with certainty uh, what the ultimate meaning will be of mastery of space. I believe we should go to the moon. But I think every citizen of this country, as well as the members of the Congress, should consider the matter carefully in making their judgment, Whoops. to which we've given attention <laughs> over many weeks and months. You know? Because it is a heavy burden. And uh, there is no sense in... Uh, agreeing uh, or desiring that the United States take an affirmative position in outer space unless we are prepared to do the work and bear the burden. Finally, if we are to win the battle Sorry. that is now going on around the world <laughs> between freedom and tyranny, the dramatic achievements in space which occurred in recent weeks should have made clear to us all, as did the Sputnik in 1957, the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere who are attempting to make a determination of which road they should take. Since early in my term, our efforts in space have been under review. With the advice of the Vice President, who is Chairman of the National Space Council, the memos you read. we have examined we'll where we are it. strong and where we are not, where we may succeed and where we may not. <laughs> Now it is time to take longer strides. Time for a great new American enterprise. Time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. So there you hear applause. I believe we possess all the resources and talents necessary. But the facts of the matter are that we have never made the national decisions or marshaled the national resources required for such leadership. We have never specified long-range goals on an urgent time schedule or managed our resources and our time so as to ensure their fulfillment. Recognizing the head start obtained by the Soviets with their large rocket engines, which gives them many months of lead time, and recognizing the likelihood that they will exploit this lead for some time to come and still more impressive successes, we nevertheless are required to make new efforts on our own. For while we cannot guarantee that we shall one day be first, we can guarantee that any failure to make this effort will make us lost. So far, so good. He hasn't said anything. He's just kind of given the 
take an additional risk by making it in full view of the world. But as shown by the feet of astronaut Shepard, this very risk enhances our stature when we are successful. But this is not merely a race. Space is open to us now, and our eagerness to share its meaning is not governed by the efforts of others. We go into space because whatever mankind must undertake, free men must fully share. I therefore ask the Congress, above and beyond the increases I have earlier requested for space activities, to provide the funds which are needed to meet the following national goals. First, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. We propose to accelerate the development of the appropriate lunar spacecraft. We propose to develop alternate liquid and solid fuel boosters much larger than any now being developed, until certain which is superior. We propose additional funds for other engine development and for like unmanned exploration. Programs. Explorations which are particularly important for one purpose which this nation will never overlook, the survival of the man who first makes this daring flight. But in a very real sense, it will not be one man going to the moon. We make this judgment affirmatively it will be an entire nation, for all of us must work to put in there. Secondly, an additional $23 million, together with $7 million already available, will accelerate development. So, at that point, he just continues. Let's see if I can do this right. Be right back where we were. Yay, I did it. So. At this point, he continues to talk about a lot of the programs and some of the successes, unmanned space exploration. But the key thing in this speech here is that he's done something here that I think a little bit has, is the reason that we have had some issues with our space program in recent history. It's been a little floundering at times, not known exactly what its mission is. There's never been anybody who really truly has set a path to a specific object and gotten everybody behind it. That's what NASA needs. And so, otherwise, it's a program trying to achieve certain things, but with no national will behind it, the money's not enough, et cetera, et cetera. You can see that it's not going to succeed. In this situation, it, you know, once again, 20 to 40 billion dollars with a budget for the entire country that's at 94.7 at that point in time. Okay, big effort. And so what has he done? He's given them a specific target and he's given them a timeline. He said, we're gonna do it by this date, by the end of the decade. Is that 1969 or 1970? You make the call. In any case though, um, so that's the grand goal that he sets the US on. Now he's ramping us up to use the space race almost as a military objective. Um, we are going to conquer space. We're going to get to the moon before the, before the Russians do. So, Roger Lanius, who is one of the curators of the National Air and Space Museum, so they were consciously a little vague about the deadline. What is the end of the decade? Is it 1969 or 1970? Regardless, they wanted to make sure they had enough time, even though initially they were being told, yeah, if we put enough money into it, we could do it maybe by 1967. Kennedy said by the end of the decade, thinking that was giving a little bit more time, as we know, we just made it. Because it's a lot bigger problem than really anybody thought. Remember now, at this point in time, NASA, do they have the facilities to do stuff like this? They don't even have the Manned Spacecraft Center. Houston doesn't exist yet. So the, the rocket test facilities to, to, to test these gigantic rockets that are going to have to be built don't exist yet. The technology to make things smaller and lighter for the lunar module. Heck, how are we gonna build a lunar lander? Where are we gonna land a rocket? Are we gonna land a lunar? We don't know. Do we know any of this? No. This is not like we're sitting here saying, we're gonna use our bomber fleet to knock out this. That's our goal. No, we're saying, hmm, 
we're going to build something that we don't have, that we don't know how to build yet, and we're going to do this. You know, so it's just pretty insane if you really think about it. So now we start off on the grand voyage of the 1960s. So Kennedy uh, really now, and the government, utilizes and embraces the space program and NASA. Um, so we have, once again, our seven strep strepid, excuse me, intrepid <laughs> star voyagers who have been chosen and who are going to be the Mercury astronauts. One has already flown. So, whoop. yep, there we go. So he has them, you know, into the Oval, Oval Office. He has their wives over, he and Jackie. They get to know them. They're friends. They hang out with them, you know. So ceremonies, constantly ceremonies calling them up after their missions. This is when Gordon Cooper had come back. So calling them up and talking to them, that gets press, fetaying them, shall we say. So, but what we see happen is, is even though while this is going on, that embrace of NASA and all the programs, Kennedy gets cold feet. Because if you think about it, does anybody know what percentage of the United States population supported in May of 1961 and those early months, how, what percentage of the population supported going to the moon? <laughs> Throw out some numbers. 30. Yeah, 30. So, 30 is the closest so far. 42% was all supported. 58% of the population was against it. Why be against it? It's a great goal. Oh, yeah. People walk on the moon. That's great. We'd look at it now. We look at it now in the hindsight of history, and it's a national prestige issue for us now. It's something we hang our hats on as Americans. So, and all those who in countries who helped us and were involved with it all hang their hats on it as something that was amazing, that was accomplished. But back then, it was a pipe dream. It was a waste of money. Why spend it on that? We've got problems in the inner cities. We can't feed, we can't run that list out for forever. We've got all these problems, but why go to the moon? So there was a number of folks who were definitely against it. Really at that point in time, conservative Republicans were against it. Um, uh, fiscal Democrats were against it because it was, and it wasn't that they were against going to the moon. They were against spending that much money on it. That was, that was a waste to spend that much money on it. But you're not going to be able to get there if you don't do that. So NASA's budget, which these days is like 0.5% of the budget, back then actually skyrocketed up to over 4% of the budget So um, for, the, for those first few years as they were building up the programs. But when he got cold feet, started off secret envoy, sent his brother to talk to the Soviets about possible cooperative efforts to go into space, to go to the moon. Um, the Soviets embraced somewhat the idea of some cooperation, and so there started to be visits, exchanges, shall we say, um, discussions, but the idea of working together, now, they're not embracing that off the bat. But in the meantime, yes, we do have visits that come over. So in any case, sorry, I wanted to, you know, here's Kennedy, once again, the embrasure, watching John Glenn and his flight, once again with the, uh, with the families, <coughs> excuse me, touring around, he's in Hangar S here. So, with John Glenn after his flight, standing next to uh, uh, Friendship 7. So, once again, during, up, up to the Gemini program, you know, all of that. So, meeting, talking about, un, you know, the unmanned, excuse me, robotic space exploration. So, but like I said, gets cold feet, makes this effort to um, reach out to the Soviets. And so, one of the first things that happens is Titov. So... How do you pronounce his first name? I forget. Germain. Ger Germain? I believe. Yeah, so Germain Titov. In any case, so um, uh, one of the Russian cosmonauts who flew after Yuri Gagarin comes over here. You can see that, you know, it goes into New York, sees Broadway plays, um, comes down to Washington, D.C., where he's there from the 2nd to the 4th. John Glenn is the person who's taking him around. Here you can see the Lincoln Memorial out, you know, in between that and the Washington Monument. Meets up with Werner von Braun. I love the look on his, Von Brown's face. <laughs> I, I, would you not love to know what's going through his mind at this moment? Yeah, uh -huh. and, you know, so that's, to me, I look at it, and it's like, I'm going to shake your hand, but I hate you. Yeah. So, in any case. 
So on panel discussions, so um, uh, you know where you got Glenn Titoff, uh, one of the rocket scientists, uh, Blagoronov. So Blagoronov. So I, once again, never exactly sure how to pronounce it. So um, from the Russian side, the deputy administrator for uh, uh, NASA over here, Hugh Dryden, meets with Kennedy. Once again, trying to get some sort of international cooperation because he knows that if he can do that, they can reduce the amount that they're spending. And he's scared now that he's not getting as much support as he thought he would. There's still, I mean, there, there's still a lot of support, but it's not quite what he had hoped. So, in any case, and the cooperation continues in the out years. Here we see, you know, some of, you know, Ed White and uh, McDivitt over there's Yuri Gagarin right there. So, um, meetings up, you know, once again. So here. Um, uh, uh, with you know Gordo Cooper, so here you have Alexei Leonov right there, and then I have to show you my favorite picture with Alexei Leonov. <laughs> Woo -hoo! Yeah, so taken after launch one of the uh, the, uh, the the Soviet rockets. It was a cold day in April in Kazakhstan. We're walking from the launch to the after party, and I saw your or, uh, Alexei Leonov was right in front of me, so I I not met him before, so I went up, tapped his shoulder, and said I just wanted to introduce myself. That's about all I got out, and he said, "Where well, your coat?" <laughs> I'm like, because I'm just wearing a polo. So, and I'm like, I like the cold. I don't mind it at all. In fact, I prefer it, you know. He just starts laughing. And then he said, must be a picture with hearty American. <laughs> <laughs> so, in any case, that's, yeah, that's what, that's when I met him. So, in any case, if you don't like us, don't accept our invitations and don't invite us to come to see you. Whether you like it or not, history is on our side. We will bury you. That was back in 1956. But this is the person that he's dealing with. So, and exchanges, don't invite us to come see you. Yes, there is this cooperation, you know. Soviets come over to visit Disneyland, you know, Soviet premier stuff, you know, it's all sorts of stuff like that. There's, the astronauts are talking to each other. It looks like they're palling it and having a good time, but there's not any cooperative effort to get into space. That never happens. And so, Kennedy has to keep embracing what he created. And then playing, you know, and playing it up essentially. So, and supporting it. Yeah. I heard once that Khrushchev didn't actually say that. He said, "We will all survive you." <laughs> I I don't know. Yeah, yeah. honestly, but that's interesting. <laughs> I'm gonna have to research that. That, that is interesting. So. so, as we move along through, you know, this year plus, you know, remember he gives the speech um, back in 1961 in May. NASA is building up tremendously. So in September of 1962, he goes and visits the burgeoning NASA facilities, goes to uh, Marshall Space Flight Center. You see him arriving here talking to Ferner von Braun. You see Lyndon Johnson in the background there. Remember, he's head of the National Space Council. He goes to Kennedy Space Center. We're going to show a bunch of pictures from that here. So as you can see here, walking along with von Braun, pointing up there, you know, so probably have seen some of these pictures before. Looking at rocket construction. So, meet Kennedy Space Center, Kurt Debus, who's the uh, uh, head of uh, Kennedy Space Center. Checking out rockets <gasps> on the launch pad. During his speech, he talks about the engines at the bot, the F 1 engines on the new rocket that they're building and how much bigger and how much more power they have than the eight engines on the Saturn. And you're sort of like, ones are on a Saturn, but you know, it's, it's all because of where he was touring and, and what he saw and what he was standing underneath, eight engines, right there, the rocket that was on the pad, which was a Saturn, but a smaller, you know, etc. The rockets were building up different versions of it. They're in the blockhouse here getting a briefing, so Johnson here, the head of the Kennedy Space Center right here, or excuse me, <laughs> the head of the, 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 the center down, it's not Kennedy Space Center at this point in time, my mistake. No, yeah, it's okay. Okay. At that, yeah, it's Kennedy. At that point, it was growing out of Marshall Space Flight Center as the yeah. Launch Operations yep. Directorate. Yep, exactly. So, in any case, though, but yeah, head of <laughs> head of all the operations there at Cape Canaveral. It's so ingrained in our heads nowadays to say Kennedy Space Center that you, you, you start saying that, but it wasn't named that until after he died. That information will come up here in a moment as well. So, giving speeches, there he is, and I love it. He's standing in front of this concept for the lunar lander. Oh. Didn't exactly come out that way, did it? <laughs> but in 1962, this was what they were thinking. As we realized, <laughs> that's a little too big. <coughs> so, just a little. Were all these built 
down at the Cape? Or were they this stuff was built, yeah, the, the, the Marshall, the, the multiple space centers. The, the, the plants, you know, obviously the lunar module was built up in, on Long Island. The command module was built in Downey, California. Engines were built up. You know, the, this was all over the U.S. Once again, he started off on a program. Remember, the, the 22 billion to 40 billion kind of thing. So that ended up employing over 400,000 people. So during the extent of the program, quite tremendous. So. And then after the day, the first day of his trip, he goes to the Cape, and he, go, he goes to Marshall and then the Cape. Then the next day, September 12th, he goes to um, the Manned Spacecraft Center. Uh, really, actually, he goes to Houston. Because this, which we look at nowadays, Johnson Space Center in Houston, which at that point in time was, you know, Manned Spacecraft Center, this doesn't exist. What is it? You know, this is the plan for it here. And this is the reality in 1962. <laughs> Not quite there yet. So, in any case, though, being built. So, what do they have? Well, they have all these sites that are in buildings all over Houston. This is Houston right here. So, this is leased facilities. So, NASA is going to move into as each of these buildings gets finished at the Manned Spacecraft Center, um, which is south, in Clear Lake, south of um, uh, Houston. They're going to move from Houston in these buildings down to there, so that's what they do. But at this point in time, he doesn't have that, so he tours these facilities. And then he goes to Rice University and speaks to 40,000 people. Doesn't look like 40,000 people in the stands, does it? Yeah. No. Unless you look this direction, behind him. So 40,000 people who were there to hear him speak, <clears throat> and speak most specifically about space, because that's what he was there for. So, whoop, let me... Now, do this once again, see if I get to the right point in the speech this time, to start with. Apologize for the last one. And the first wave of nuclear power. And this generation does not intend to founder in the backwash of the coming age of space. We mean to be a part of it. We mean to lead it. world now look into space to the moon <coughs> and to the planets beyond and we have vowed that we shall not see it governed by a hostile flag of conquest but by a banner of freedom look at all the people in the background <laughs> we have vowed that we shall not see space a hot day filled with weapons of mass destruction but with instruments of knowledge and understanding Yet the vows of this nation can only be fulfilled if we in this nation are first, and therefore we intend to be first. So listen to the tone, timber, what he's saying. In it's very short, different. Our leadership in science and industry, our hopes for peace and security, our obligations to ourselves as well as others, all require us to make this effort, to solve these mysteries, to solve them for the good of all men, and to become the world's leading space-faring nation. We set sail on this new sea because there is new knowledge to be gained and new rights to be won, and they must be won and used for the progress of all people. For space science, like nuclear science and all technology, has no conscience of its own. Whether it will become a force for good or ill depends on man. And only if the United States occupies a position of preeminence can we help decide whether this new ocean will be a sea of peace or a new terrifying theater of war. I do not say that we should or will go unprotected against the hostile misuse of space any more than we go unprotected against the hostile use of land or sea. But I do say that space can be explored and mastered without feeding the fires of war 
without repeating the mistakes that man has made in extending his writ around this globe of ours. There is no strife. No the first part of the speech he'd spent no talking about the history in outer space and as yet. the context of history. Its hazards are hostile to us all. So its conquest deserves the best of all mankind. And its opportunity for peaceful cooperation may never come again. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? This is what we usually And have. they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. <laughs> there. Oh, the rest of the speech is just as good. So, you'll, if you just listened to the speech and the, the, the delivery there, and also the audience, when you're delivering it to Congress, realistically, you're, you have to deli you're delivering programs, because they are the money, they hold the purse strings, you know, so it's, it's about money. Here, this is about continuing the motivation continuing to inspire Americans to support the program. NASA was doing great things with this. NASA, and I'm not sure that Dave wasn't involved with the days of this as well, that NASA had, it went into the schools of journalism and fatayed them, brought them to launches, you know, so they basically created a cadre of, of reporters that were, that loved NASA you know, that supported NASA, that wrote about NASA. They did a lot of that across the United States. NASA worked very hard on not just building the spacecraft and launching them and that sort of stuff. They worked really hard on making sure that they had support from the people who did make sure that the politicians then provided the money and stuff like that. Kennedy speaking here in this speech, once again, is all about, you know, the motivation. But there were still issues. There were still issues that went on in the background, um, that were going on in the background. But all of what we talked about with that embracing of the astronauts, the missions, NASA, all of it, that continued all the way up until you know, his eventual assassination uh, in 1963. Just to see it, this is what the budget for NASA did. You know, it was coming up, but then all of a sudden, bam, you know, goes up. Then you see, even before, you know, because you see the decrease here in 1967. We hadn't landed on the moon yet, okay? But all the infrastructure had been built up, but now the cuts started to come in, and it goes down just as fast. And then slowly over the years goes further and further and further and further down to the point where it is about 0.5% of, uh, of the U.S. budget. So, but his speech was about motivating folks, talking about space as a beckoning frontier to go after, there was really, you know, the, uh, um, the, the three parts of the speech. The first was space is that, that beckoning frontier. The second one was an articulation of the time. <clears throat> and he did put it in, in a big context. So, and he was trying to locate the endeavor of the space race in that historical moment of urgency that had happened in the past as well. So, and then at the end, it's that cumulative strategy. Um, uh, uh, that basically was an invitation to the audience um, to live up to the, uh, uh, to the U.S.'s heritage of exploration. And so all of it, what, you, if you ever get a chance, go back online and just watch the entire speech. It's phenomenal. Most of us just know that moment. You know, why does Rice play Texas? By the way, that was an ad lib <laughs> at the moment. He just added that in at the last second, and he played to the crowd. The rest of the speech also plays to Texas. Once again, get him behind you, humor, every, you know, everything like that. So, John F. Kennedy, in his inaugural address, remember, this is back in January of 1961, let every nation know whether it wishes us will, well or ill, 
that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to ensure the survival and success of liberty. He knew that they were in a Cold War and that they needed to win that Cold War. One of the arenas for winning that Cold War was space. And he figured out what the goal was to get, you know, for us to be able to beat the Soviets in the space race. And he set that goal out there, gave a deadline, and then sadly was killed before they could get to that deadline. But I think if you really look back on it, and this is probably a lecture in and of itself, the fact of him getting assassinated probably is why we made it to the moon by the end of the decade. I think if he hadn't, those budgets would have gone down to the point where it would have happened, but much later. But everybody after he was killed rallied behind and got galvanized on that. We're going we're gonna to meet Kennedy's, you know, this is going to be his legacy. We're going to meet this deadline. And that clock started ticking at NASA really hard. Before it had been, you know, kind of going along. They knew that deadline was out there, but now it was looming over them all the time. So I'm finished with talking about that. Just want to bring up one last little thing, you know, kind of things that are about to happen. We're going to bring this film in here for the summer, Astronaut Ocean to Orbit, um, uh, which will be a nice, fun uh, film. It talks about how they train in the Neutral Buoyancy Lab for Operation Space and also how they work at at uh, essentially space stations that are under the water off the coast of Florida um, uh, to prepare for their missions of, of operating in space as well. So, and then I always leave with just a thought. <laughs> <laughs> Relax this weekend, kick back. Mm -hmm. I love this ad when they put, you know, put that image out. So, <laughs> And then one more thing. I usually have the flag flying in space. No, nope, this week. That's me and Charlie Duke holding up the flag um, after he had uh, he had signed it for me. So, and the other thing, once again, yeah, I'm gonna honor mothers. There's my wife and the mother of my children. Have to do that. Questions? Yes. In that one speech when Kennedy said, you know, we will go to the moon yes. and do the other thing. Any thoughts on? <laughs> it's things do the other plural. things in this decade? Yes. Yeah, so. What's that? It's, it's the things plural. It's not singular. Yeah. No. No. It, it is. It is things. Except for those. Remember all the stuff that I talked about that was the Cold War. The, it, it's everything. Oh. You know, and doing it all freely, doing it all openly, doing you know. So whatever the achievement was, nuclear power, you know, military power, the uh, um, the agricultural, you know, um, uh, preeminence. Whatever it was, th those were all those things, you know. So, and that was, it was kind of an aside, but it made sure that everybody knew that space wasn't the only thing. It's what I'm talking about now, but it's everything. It's all these things that are going to be difficult for us. When somebody gets attacked, we need to support them. If a nation is getting divided by communism, we need to support it. You know, it was all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. Any other questions before we? Yep. When Germany fell, did the Russians get their hands on any B-1s or B-2s? The, the Russians got, yes. So when, yeah, when Germany fell, there was a split of material and, and uh, uh, engineers. And so, yes, a number of the engineers also did end up in Russia. Some of the, yeah. yeah uh, if I could, because I, I know a bit about this, I haven't been in home school. Yep. Um, the Von Braun team positioned themselves yeah. in the American sector. Yep. It was a point of pride with them that they were not captured by the American army. They positioned themselves and surrendered. Surrendered. When they got close enough, they sent Magnus down to meet the American army because Magnus was the only one in the group that spoke English. He runs into a corporal from Milwaukee who spoke fluent German. What are the odds? Actually, it was from Sheboygan. <laughs> okay. Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And, uh, <laughs> Fun fact. Uh, so, and, and they wind up coming here. The Russians did get, did capture a number of the engineers uh, and were absolutely furious and raged because we violated the agreement that the four powers had made and made a mad dash to Pinamunde and it ripped off as much machine tool and rockets and planes and everything else as we could load up and whatever rolling stock was left and got it in a train into the American sector before the Russians could do anything. 200 here, train cars worth of material. Wow. Yeah, but here's the fun part. Sputnik 1 goes up and then again uh, uh, Yuri Gagarin before we can be first and people are saying, well, I get the Rush guess the Russians uh, or we got the wrong German engineers and the Russians got the right ones. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, all of the stories around that are always hilarious. But yes, there was a split. They had the sights. 
but they were furious that we had gone in and taken so much of the stuff out before they got there. Any other questions before I let Kathy? Yes? I just had one. On your chart, a few slides back, it showed the budget over the yes. course of history for NASA. Yeah. After it leveled off, it looks like, regardless of which political party is in office, the administration has been pretty consistent. Um, so would you say it's fairly consistent Democrats or Republicans to yeah. support NASA? Yep. Yep. It's been... Not, neither party has uh, made a significant effort to uh, set a true goal with a deadline, etc. There was what I will call half-hearted attempts at it, but that's the key thing here. Kennedy made it, said this, this in front of Congress, this is what we're doing, and then he supported it. His administration supported it. And, you know, he got the people and then obviously Congress to support it as well. That's what hasn't happened since that point in time. So there's always support for NASA, but it's support for NASA for what it's doing right now. And maybe we'll add this amount to it. But that amount, as you can see, right. exactly. doesn't, it, it, you know, it's not that much of a difference in the big picture of, of you know, what the percentage of the, G, of the, of the GDP of the budget is. So, any other questions? With that, I'm going to turn it over to Kathy for a couple of marketing announcements, but I will just say here at the end, thank you so much. Oh, sorry, one thing. The items that are up here, please don't touch. These are actual, this one right here and this one right here are spy cameras that actually flew over the Soviet Union on, bull, on a balloon. So the amazing thing about this one, if you, if you take a look at it, it's a panoramic camera. This one has two lenses. This one's a panoramic camera. And so it slides like that to take the pictures. These were all part of a program that was called Project Genitrex back in the late 1950s. So before we had satellites, very obviously. But this was the generation of camera. You've probably heard of the Project Corona, where we did have the satellites going over. This essentially is the same camera that was flying on Project Corona, but this was flown on a, on a high altitude balloon. It was up very at the high end of the atmosphere between 50 and 100,000, you know, so and then and then just flew across the Soviet Union. These were actual, these were um, cameras or lenses that were utilized to figure out what the angle of the sun was. So that they knew the camera took a picture at a specific time and that they knew where the sun was at that time. And this told them what angle the sun was so they knew exactly where the camera was pointing, which direction it was pointing. So, sorry, Kathy. Thank you.